topic is Lean Project Management and Visual Work Management, Eight Keys for Success in 2015, and this is a four-part series. Um, our speakers today are myself, I'm the VP of Marketing at Playbook, Eric Graves, our VP of Product Development, and Paul DeLong, who is our VP of Services. In terms of agenda, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to Playbook the company, and at which point I'll hand over the webinar to Eric and Paul. Eric will be leading the discussion, and Paul will offer support for Eric. Eric's going to cover the format of the webinar, common problems in hardware product development, which I'm sure you are all aware of, discuss solutions such as managing queues, resource utilization, and availability, how Playbook supports the resolution of these issues, we'll summarize findings, and there'll be a Q&A session at the end. Um, and we'd also be so appreciative if you would answer a question regarding the value received from the webinar in the form of a one-question poll at the very, very end. So about Playbook. This solution was developed with a lot of effort over a long period of time solving a complex problem, how to deliver high-quality, innovative products faster. The methods we're going to discuss developed out of solving this problem, working with over 16, 60 companies, both large and small blue chip clients and smaller startups. We created a perfect, which this, this environment created a perfect environment for rapid learning about what worked and what didn't in new product development. What all the companies had in common is they wanted to deliver to market faster and, of course, deliver quality and innovative products. And, in fact, it's been proven that rapid innovation process for companies is the key to financial success. If you generate 80% of your revenue through new products, you will double your market cap in five years. However, all the companies suffered the same problem, which is 90% of their products were late to market. So this is why we are here today, to discuss some of the principles that combat these problems and improve product development success. So with that, I will hand it over to Eric, the expert from Playbook on making product development systems run faster. Uh, thanks, Alyssa. Hi, everybody. Um, so uh, this is going to be a little different than your average webinar. Uh, we do an introduction to the principles and methods, like, much like we're going to do today uh, in person when we're starting teams on Playbook. You know, it's a very interactive session, and by being interactive, it improves people's understanding, and their attention level, and really I'm just more comfortable not lecturing to a silent crowd for an hour. So we're going to try to achieve that today by making today's webinar interactive as well. Uh, we do have quite a few attendees, more than we uh, expected, so um, please, uh, but still please feel free to jump right in and, and uh, ask and answer questions. Um, if you're in a quiet place and you can participate, uh, please raise your hand now, and we'll unmute you. Uh, if you haven't yet entered your audio pan and you're joined via the telephone, please go ahead and do that now. Um, we're going to ask you occasional questions. We do have a lot to cover in an hour, so please provide short answers. Ask a couple of answers, we'll just move on. Uh, we do have mostly engineering managers and VPs attending today, so this webinar series may be a little bit more advanced than our introductory course. Um, that's for everybody on the team. might stump you a little on some of my questions. Uh, we'll see. If I do, I'll just go ahead and say the answer so we can keep moving. And we do have periodic uh, question and answer sessions through the webinar. And uh, so um, please ask your questions over the question using the questions window, and we'll stop periodically to answer those. Okay. All right. So. Uh, I'd like to, we'd like to start out with a question, just ask everybody what, what are the problems you're experiencing in product development. But we just spend the whole time talking about that, and really we've asked this question many times before, and the responses we receive are the same every time. And everybody's dealing with the same problems, some a little more in one place or the other, but they're all related. Uh, the format we're looking at here is a current reality tree. It's a tool, tool from the theory of constraint. It shows the symptoms toward the top. Uh, the causes toward the bottom and these self-reinforcing loops that help uh, keep our system stuck in this slow, stable, slow, traditional mode. Uh, the topics we're going to be discussing over the course of the webinar series address most of these problems, but not necessarily all of them. Uh, the primary focus for the first three webinars are these problems we see on the left, namely the number of active projects, uh, the resource shortages, invisible work, communication, and priorities. 
Uh, in the last webinar, we're going to turn our attention to these uh, problems on the right, namely project and business risk, and learning quickly about customers, COGS, and technical specifications. Okay, we're going to start by setting the stage for the series and making one fundamental principle very clear. That speed matters. Speed matters a lot. Uh, here we're looking at the profit and sensitivities of a typical new product development project. Uh, these show how profit is expected to change according to changes in expenses on the, pro on the project, unit cost, sales volume, and schedule. Uh, the cost of delay is shown on the far right. right here. Uh, the cost of delay for our projects is often very high. We'll show one here, $400,000, half a million dollars per month is about an average for all the new products we see. Uh, some are upwards of $15 million a month. Uh, certainly, you may be wondering, one month is uh, obviously well, more than 1%, uh, as we're using in the other sensitivities, so it's really a fair comparison. Uh, I'll ask you, you know, how long would you need to extend your project's duration to reduce your COGS another 1% or add a feature that's going to increase your sales another 1%. Usually it's at least a couple of weeks, so that's why we have more of an apples to apples comparison of a, a big chunk of time for little changes in unit cost and sales, vol sales volumes. Um, all of the underlying principles and concepts we'll be discussing are focusing on increasing product development profits, profits, and a big component of that's the speed with which we complete our projects. Unfortunately, one of the big root problems in the CRT indicates uh, companies are highly focused on expenses and not so focused on speed. So here's our first question. Well, why do you think that is? Why are companies all more focused on expenses and budgets than on going fast? Anyone care to chime in? I think expenses are very measurable. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I think that's what it comes down to. Is it's it's easy to see. You know, it's on all the reports that we get. It's very measurable and nice and concrete. Unfortunately, there are a lot of other things that aren't so concrete, and uh, making them visible is a big part of what we're going to be talking about. You know, this is the, the opportunity cost that we see in this cost of delay, and other things you know, just really aren't that visible, aren't that concrete. And so, making those things more visible is very much at the heart of these webinars. Starting with the big one, resource queues. So a queue is where the flow of something stops and waits for the needed resource in front of it to become available. And we all live through these on a very regular basis in everyday life, as well as in our product development systems. I'd like to ask for some examples. I'll get started with an easy one. A shopper is waiting in line at the grocery store. Anybody else have any examples of queues that we deal with in everyday life? Anyone? You review a, a large set of documents, a large set of drawings, a large set of documents at one time. Yeah, that's very much uh, a good example for product development systems. We got another one? Okay. Well, uh, we'll just jump in and keep going. So in the, con the common examples in everyday life, Standing in line for security at the airport, we've all done that a number of occasions. Uh, in product development, you know, ECO is being waited to be processed by someone in back control and put into the approval cycle, parts waiting to be inspected. And there's a million, million examples of cues in our product development system, and most of them very much slow the pro flow of projects through our system. Unfortunately, many of them aren't visible. So a question. Uh, how do we know which machine, if we go down on our production floor and look around, how do we know which machine is having an issue? Which one is having a little problem right now? Any thoughts? The light's flashing. Yeah. Uh, typically, we have a big stack of parts sitting in front yeah, of Yeah, exactly. There's a big pile of parts. Very visible. The queue in front of that machine is very, very visible. And it indicates to us the problem in that machine. So uh, in product development, you go look around in product development and look at the development team. How can we tell where the problems are? 
Well, we can't. Sellers delayed projects and missed dates usually. And so uh, making, you know, we could if we can see the cues and making those cues visible and minimizing them is the first principle we're going to be talking about today. One of the keys to achieving much faster projects. All right, so digging into these cues a little bit, uh, taking a look at the task. The duration of each task in our product project is the sum of two factors on that task. The wait time or the queue time, the time that task sits there waiting for the person to start working on it, and then the execute time, the time it takes to get from the beginning of that task to the end of that task and uh, mark it complete. Uh, generally speaking, as we see in this picture of Black Friday, uh, the wait time is typically much greater than execute time. Uh, some common examples, ECOs sit in somebody's inbox for days when it only takes a few minutes to review and sign. Information waiting in someone's head for days for the status meeting uh, when it only takes a few seconds to pass along to someone else when the, when the time comes. And really, the way we've loaded up our systems, the more majority of the development time is spent with these tasks sitting there waiting for the resource to become available. So what? What does it matter? How much do these long queues really delay our projects? So here we see a view of a queue of tasks waiting for a single resource. Uh, in this case, uh, we have pink tasks and yellow tasks. The pink tasks indicate a critical task, a task on the critical path of the related project. Every day, by definition, a critical task that goes uncompleted is one day our project completion is likely to be delayed. Every day a critical task sits in the queue unnecessarily is one day the project is delayed unnecessarily. So certainly if we can see these, we can eliminate these delays and their ripple effect directly to our project completion dates. Uh, we can save a lot of time on our projects and we can do exactly that if we execute some specific practices. To the great extent, our ability to execute these practices depends first and foremost on our ability to see these queues. You do this by using visual work management tools that show us these queues and the other information we need to clear them well, prevent them from costing us much time or even occurring in the first place. So to manage queues, we first need to understand some of the reasons why queues occur in the first place. Uh, before we get into this, I just want to uh, take a second and ask, you know, how's the pace? Are we going fast enough, too fast? And, and are there any questions so far? Eric, this is Paul, and uh, currently there are no questions that have been asked, but perhaps somebody has one now. Okay. We're good, Paul. Okay. Well, we'll just keep trucking then. Uh, so what we're looking at here is what we call a cumulative flow diagram. Uh, we can use this diagram to develop a better understanding of how the queues form. Uh, in the example we're looking at, the arrival rate which is the slope of the line on the left, is two items per day. The departure rate, the line on the right, slope of the line on the right is one item per day. Uh, the height of the shaded area at any point in time along the horizontal is the number of items in the queue at that time. And the width is the expected duration for the items entering the queue on that day. So a uh, real quick example, let's say these items in the tasks being assigned, these items, the, the queue that we're looking at are the tasks being assigned to one of our development resources. He's receiving approximately two tasks to go execute per day and getting approximately one task done per day. Uh, so after 10 days, how many tasks will that resource have in their queue? Coming in at two a day and leaving at one a day after 10 days, how many are sitting there? So we pulled out our slide rules, we came up with 10. All right, good answer. You got it right. So assuming nothing changes, you got 10 items in the queue, how long will it take a resource to complete the task that enters the queue and is being assigned to that resource on day 10? How long before that task is complete? That's yeah, it, it's 10 days. So, uh, and day 10, we've got 10 to complete. 
we're getting them done at a rate of one per day. So this is our total duration, 10 more days. You know, notice we don't have to wait 10 whole days to find out that the task is late uh, to get feedback about the completion date of that task. We can look at the queue and know when the task is going to be completed just by knowing the size of the queue and the rate at which items are completed. Visible queues very much give us a leading indicator of the completion dates on those tasks, generally speaking, early enough that we stand a much better chance of being able to avoid these delays. So uh, what makes the queue go away? What is it that we can do to burn down the items in a queue? Really two major things that we can do, as indicated on the graph here. What are they? Uh, so what do we want to do with the arrival rate? Want to do something with the arrival rate? We're going to reduce the arrival rate. Exactly. That's one. The other one is? Increase the departure rate. Through more exactly. 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 So those are two big ones. Um, any ideas for how we reduce arrival rate? <laughs> <laughs> we hire more chuckleheads. To <laughs> uh, so that's so that's uh, that's increasing the departure rate. You know, we can increase capacity, oh, okay. things like that. We'll we'll increase the departure rate that way. How do we how do we decrease the arrival rate? Separate maybe between critical path tasks and non-critical path yeah, tasks. Yeah, exactly, and, and basically hold back the non-critical path tasks, right? So it's, it is. It's a rival. We, we make this a little more shallow by managing the demand, by not letting it be this deep, uh, by managing the demand, and we increase departure rate in a number of different ways, increasing capacity, uh, get more out of our resources availability, um, potentially working faster. Uh, although that too often uh, creates some risks, so not always the best solution. So. Um, so the first one we'll talk about is how uh, is the impact of capacity and uh, the overloads in our product development system. So absolutely, the primary source of queues is an overloaded system. You know, for example, all the shoppers out there on Black Friday, all the cars on the highway at rush hour, when there's too much work in the system for the resources in the system, the wait time gets very, very long. Um, system loading, capacity utilization, two words for basically the same thing. And as the graph here indicates, capacity utilization is a nonlinear effect on cycle time. You know, high utilization, the small changes can have a big impact. We're over here in this area and we change it a little bit, we have a big impact. So. As an example, we're all driving down the highway at rush hour at a time. Things are running pretty quickly, but cars are pretty close together, and it's rush hour, and a plastic trash bag happens to blow across the highway. What happens? Good luck. Yeah, exactly. It's one little person, one, whoever's in front of the trash bag taps on their brakes, the person behind them taps on their brakes, and all of a sudden this little blip of a trash bag creates one of these mystery clogs that uh, it slows down or stops the flow for no apparent reason. And how long does it take for that flow to disperse when it's rush hour, or for that clog to disperse? It, it takes forever. It takes a really long time, because at high utilization, queues form quickly, and they disperse slowly, and everybody waiting in that queue is wasting time. And that's what's happening very much with our tasks. Um, so the image shows the nonlinear effect of capacity utilization on duration. This is a curve from queuing theory. There's a formula for this from queuing uh, theory. And this is reflective of the types of queues which form in our typical system. Uh, wherever we are on the cure curve, we go halfway to 100%. We approximately double the cycle time. So for example, it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The highway is loaded at 60%. takes us 10 minutes to get home. 4 o'clock, it's loaded at 80%. It takes us 20 minutes to get home. 5 o'clock, it's loaded at 90%. It takes us 40 minutes to get home, that kind of thing. Every time we take a step halfway between where we are to 100%, we double the cycle time, essentially. And so at what percent utilization are we running our product development systems typically? We like to run right around 105%. <laughs> 
that's our that's our favorite number. Yeah, that's, 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 that's a sweet spot. Yeah, exactly. I want sorry, to go ahead. I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just saying I like to see some overtime. <laughs> so 110 percent. 110 percent. All right. So so let's look at another system. Uh, let's look at our manufacturing system. How what utilization do we run our manufacturing system? I kind of gave you the answer here, but uh, you know, really in your on your production floors, your manufacturing engineers, how how much do they expect to use their machines? Anybody go higher than 80 for 85 percent on your manufacturing floors? Typically not over 85. Yeah, it's somewhere in the 80, 85 percent range. When you get your variability down and got your machines tuned up, you can operate somewhere in that range. So we allocate our machines a good hour and 15 minutes of every eight-hour day set aside for something else besides productive work. Why do, why do we do that? Why do we run our machines at such a low, and why do we plan to use our machines at such a low capacity? So that we can have on-time delivery. There's maintenance. There's yeah. there's uh, things that crop up. Rework. Rework. Yeah. Yep. Stuff happens, right? Not you know. In addition to the stuff that's the planned stuff, the maintenance. There's unplanned maintenance. There's another you know rework that needs to occur, and all this stuff. You know, using the politically correct term, stuff happens. If we you know load it much higher than 85 percent. It's entirely too long to get through it, and we have too much money tied up and uncompleted work in progress. So how much extra time do we allocate to our development resources to accommodate the stuff that happens in product development? Anybody load your resources to less than 80 85 percent? Yeah, exactly. So. We have a, a variable system. We load it up with entirely too much work, and uh, things take a long time. You know, we discussed this is a plastic bag blowing across the highway. Variability causes little blips in the flow to produce much longer clues, cues. Excuse me. The more blips and the bigger those blips, the lower utilization level we must operate in order to accommodate those blips and keep the system moving. So which is more variable, more unpredictable, and uneven, and full of these weird stuff that happens? Manufacturing or product development? Product development is highly yeah, variable. Absolutely. I mean, there's all kinds of uncertainty in product development. So what do we think of the idea of trying to eliminate all the variability, all of the un you know, unpredictability in product development? Like, you know, we've done really effectively in lean manufacturing. Why don't we just do that in product development too? Product time to market is so important. No, product development is inherently unpredictable. Absolutely, absolutely. It, if you if we're going to do something that's going to take all the unpredictability out, we're going to do something that isn't innovative. If we do something that isn't innovative. We're going to do something that doesn't sell. That's what it comes down to. So to sell and be profitable, our products absolutely have to be innovative. And with innovation comes uncertainty and risk and variation and unpredictability and all that variability. Um, so we're going to discuss this a little bit more later. Uh, the point is we can't we can remove some variability, and removing some variability is very important. We can't remove all the variability. We need to be very careful about what we remove and what we don't, and how we handle the variability in our system. Uh, anybody have any examples? What are some of the examples of some of the, what we would call bad variability, stuff that happens in product development that really we could prevent without too much hassle? Yeah, poor assumption on marketing requirements. Yep, bad assumption. Project or scope, yeah, scope creep. Yep. Yeah, so there, there, there are a lot. A lot of them fall in the area of risk. So they materialize in the form of risk. We had this plan, and all of a sudden that plan is gone because this risk that we either recognized or didn't all of a sudden materialized in front of us and caused all these problems. So there are many, you know, several techniques for reducing bad variability. 
Uh, we'll touch on some of them a little bit more ma later, but man managing risks, you can standardize some processes, make it not so up to the, each individual user, how long it takes to get through it. You can reuse designs, that's a way of min minimizing risks, has to make the work better, you know, when it comes time to building plans, things like that. Smaller batches, that's a, that's a big one too. But even with these, there's always going to be higher variability in product development because there's always going to be innovation and because innovation is always going to sell better. And variability is going to cause our capacity utilization curve to rise sooner, which means we have to run our system with even more spare capacity at 70% utilization or less even if we want things to go quickly through it. Um, one of the reasons is because you know, too often we also we think we're going to save a little time by batching up some work, delivering it in larger batches, and that ends up making things worse, as we see here. So here we've got an example, you know, some examples of adding batches of work to an already overloaded system and, and the impact of that. Uh, a big group of cars entering a clogged highway all at, at one time. That has a big impact on slowing down that point in the highway. And is much of the reason why there are metering lights on, on a lot of highways these days, to force a smaller batch accommodation into that system. Another example, ECOs, a bunch of ECOs being submitted for release right at the end of the project, all simultaneously. And all of a sudden, we've got a big batch of ECOs in our system to process. So the problem with batches is, a number of things, one of which is that they spend time in two queues. All of the items in a batch spend time in two queues, the inbox queue and there's the outbox queue. So for example, I'm an approver. I have 10 drawings on an ECO I need to review. Uh, I look at drawing number one, and while I'm looking at drawing number one, drawings number two through 10 are sitting there doing nothing. And then when I'm done, I put drawing number one aside and look at drawing number two. The so number one is over here on my right doing nothing. And number three through 10 are over on my left, still doing nothing while I'm looking at number two. This, as, as it goes through all 10 of those, every one of those items spends a little time waiting to get processed and a little time waiting for the one after it to get processed. And every one of those cues, every one of those wastes a little time on, some of our, on, on the work in our system. Uh, reducing batch sizes is big. Uh, we're not going to go into a whole lot more detail on that one in this session. We're going to move on to other things, um, namely these other items, controlling the flow, increasing availability, reducing bad load, um, increasing capacity. So um, you know, what we see here are the, the top, the big hitters in terms of what we can do to reduce the time that our tasks spend in these queues and the cost of the queue in the first place. Uh, certainly increased capacity. Uh, we'll talk about that here in a second. Uh, that's pretty much the obvious one. Variability we talked about and reducing bad variability. Uh, we've talked about that mostly. We'll get back to it a little bit later. Um, but for the most part, we've talked about that, so we'll move on. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about increasing availability and managing demand in this section here and the impacts of that and how we do that. And we'll dig into that more when we get to the second webinar. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, controlling the flow, you know, resequencing items in the queue to get the correct priorities pulled up front, moving work to other resources, things like that. We'll talk about that uh, a little more in webinar two, and then the batch sizes we're going to get to in webinar three. So let's take a quick look at uh, increasing capacity. So what's the downside to increasing capacity? Why don't we all just add a bunch of people to our system and get a bunch of projects done faster? That adds complexity to yeah cost yeah. absolutely yeah and those are those are big ones right it's, it's expensive and every person you add adds a bit of complexity and a bit of training time and you know, every person you add there's a diminishing return on how much that person how much time that person buys you on your projects you can see the example here if I go from two resources to three I cut the cycle time on this project uh, by a third. If I go from three resources to four, I cut a little more. If I go from four to five, I cut a little, a little bit more. But every every new resource shortens my cycle a little bit less. So there's a diminishing return, and at some point I reach that 
point where each new resource doesn't pay for themselves. They have more complexity, more training time, and it doesn't buy us anything. Um, and so that's not even the worst of it. So what happens, we, we add some resources and we get through our backlog and start to free up some of those resources. What happens? They go find other things to do. Exactly. We start seeing people twiddling thumbs. Twiddling thumbs seems like waste, so we dump more work in the system to keep them busy. And all of a sudden, before we know it, what we have is a more expensive, bigger, slow system, just like we had before. So we can't just add capacity without also actively managing that capacity. We manage the demand on that capacity. Okay, so let's go to looking about what managing demand looks like. Uh, so in the top image here, we've loaded four projects into our system at the same time and spread our resources thinly across them. Uh, if we apply all of those resources instead to focus on two projects as shown at the bottom, instead of four, all of them are completed earlier. Some of them are completed much earlier. So why are each of the projects completed in less than half the time in the lower scenario? The idea being here that uh, some of these resources are working on more than one of these projects in this scenario, and maybe they're not working on more than one of the projects in this scenario. They've got them all focused on the two projects in the system instead of spread out across many more. Why do they get to be less than half the time in this case? Since we have fewer cars on the road, we have less, better flow and less gridlock. Yeah, that's basically that's taking car C and car D off of the road. Yeah, exactly. And that has that has a number of different impacts. A, um, people are more focused on what they're doing on projects A and B. They're not switching back and forth between something on B and something on D, and back to something on B and back to something on D again. So we don't waste as much time. On switching costs, we don't pay less. You know, in addition to that, not so much time goes on. You're like me, and a few months goes by, and you can't remember what you did a few months ago. It helps if there aren't so many months going by between you know, what you decided back way back when and what you have to do with it later when it comes time to change it. So you forget stuff, and you forget stuff that costs you more time, which ends up expanding the project more. So why are, you'll notice here, Project C and D, they're even shorter than Project A and B. How can that be? What are some scenarios where that can occur? All right. Well, it's basically, generally speaking, we learn things as we're going through our projects. And if we learn some things on Projects A and B, that we can apply to C and D right off the bat. In this case, we get them done faster. Whereas in this case, maybe we learned out here on project A after we already committed something on project C and D, and learning that too late cost us time on C and D. So there's two benefits, and, the, and there's a lot of dollars involved. You know, getting project A and B done a lot earlier, there's a cost of delay to those. For every month, there's a half a million dollars in our pocket, roughly speaking, on an average project, uh, and there's a, lot, so there's a lot of money to be made by getting these things done more quickly. And there's the benefit of the late start. We make these a lot shorter, a lot faster by it being able to focus on them and by being able to incorporate the knowledge we gained on projects before them. So uh, throttling demand, that's how we do this, managing demand. Throttling demand is basically controlling the rate at which we're putting work into the system. There's really two ways to accomplish this. Uh, one is pacing the system. We allow one new project per quarter or per month, depending on the pace of our system. The problem with that option is that it doesn't necessarily take into account any variability. We may get done with the previous project before the next project is ready, you know, really slated to get into the system, or we might still be working on the previous project when, the other, when it's time for the other one to come along. If we're forced to work on a pace and that pace isn't adjusted for the for what's really happening on the system, 
we may end up having to force work into the system and slow things down instead. So better is to use a second technique that uses work in process constraints, work in progress constraints, and pull. Uh, the short explanation there, we'll get into more later, but it's the short explanation is that we're basically allowed to start the next project when we finish the previous one. Uh, this takes into conditions of our current system into account and accommodates the variability that's in it. So work in progress constraints limit the amount of work in the system, and as long as we can still utilize our resources well, they help maximize the throughput of the system, just in part because they reduce multitasking and help increase the productivity of the resources. Um, so here we've zoomed in to look at the same phenomenon with a sing within a single resource. And we're looking at the execute portion of the resources tasks. Uh, we don't manage the demand on our resources and we dump a lot of work on them, all to just do as quickly as you can. We end up causing them to multitask, you know, as we show in the lower image. And the result of that is it makes all of these tasks longer by reducing the resources availability to each task. I will dig into the more of this in into this picture and the many reasons for multitasking and the cost of multitasking. We're really going to get into that more in the next webinar. Uh, in the meantime, I'm just showing this in order to make a point about what multitasking does to create variability in cues in our system and what very and what multitasking does to slow the throughput, and make our project durations much longer and far less certain. So here. We've plotted, so let me back up a little bit. So I want to point out uh, the area inside each of these squares is the amount of work we have in each of these tasks. So each of these are roughly the same amount of work type tasks. And we can calculate the duration of that task by, look, by using terms for work, availability, and availability. So the equation comes out. You know, the total duration is Q time plus execute time, and the execute time is the work you have in that task divided by the availability to work on that task. So, for example, we've got a 20-hour task. It takes our, you know, our resource only gets four hours a day to work on it. How long will it take to complete? 20 hours, four hours a day, five days. Execute duration becomes five days. Pretty, pretty simple, pretty straightforward, and we can see here is by multitasking, we're pushing ourselves and we're constantly operating at the left end of this curve. So when we're operating at the left end of this curve, how much certain do we have in our task directions when we're operating in that range? How much or little changes in our availability going to impact how long our task takes? I'm sure you're thinking it. Small changes in availability in this range become big changes in our durations. And you know, the moral of the story being that the more work we stuff in the system, the more we push work on our resources, the more they multitask. Multitasking causes all of those tasks, the execution time, to get longer and less certain. And the result of that is even more variability in our already loaded up system. So we're going to talk a little more about this stuff in this graph when we get to the next webinar. But in the meantime, let's move on. Um, so I've got another uh, block here to, to talk about questions. Are there some questions here to touch on before we get on to the next thing? Well, uh, we have one question. It says, um, I understand that loading resources to high levels results in high cycle times. But what does it mean in a day-to-day -day environment to load my resources with less work. Won't the excess time be wasted? Ah, good question. Um, so the answer is no. Um, what work gets done in the present and the past, uh, you know, the, the downtime that you schedule for your machines, a lot of time that's used anyway. Um, in the same case for product development resources, if there's not, if there's space in a resources day, many times there's uh, some other tasks that we can have that resource work on that's going to move our project forward. It wasn't originally slated for that person, but can be because they happen to be available on that day when that resource 
uh, when that task is needed. Uh, in other cases, there's a million other things that we can do to help uh, improve our productivity uh, and you know, the knowledge on the resource and make them more flexible and more able to adapt to those other tasks that come along. You know, we can always learn to be more flexible and, and more useful in other situations during the little bit of time they have. And, and lastly, there's always, you know, when we really get into understanding risks and risk management, there's always a risk that we can spend some time mitigating that's going to pay for that time we spend mitigating. Loading up the system instead with a bunch of extra work it takes that time away. We uh, really need some extra elbow, extra elbow room in our future to be able to accommodate the stuff that comes up. And uh, that elbow room is absolutely going to get used when the time comes. OK. All right. A any other questions at this time? Yeah, I, I think the question uh, was kind of focused around uh, student syndrome. So if we reduce the number of tasks that a particular resource has to do, we don't necessarily pick up any in any short, uh, we don't shorten the duration at all. We have to manually shorten the duration as well. Otherwise, yeah. people off those tasks till the last minute anyway, and they'll deliver at the same time. And I think that's kind of what he was talking about is, you know, the, the effect of student syndrome. So yeah, I, I believe you have to do both. You have to limit the number of tasks and shorten the time uh, uh, given to deliver those tasks. Yeah, thank you very much for, for mentioning that. Um, yeah, so for those not familiar, I don't, we're going to get far more into student syndrome and task buffers um, in either number two, webinar two, or number, webinar three. It's toward the tail end of two. I'm not sure exactly how, you know, how much time we'll have uh, yet. But uh, a, 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 one of the assumptions that we make as part of accelerating this whole system is doing exactly what you mentioned, which is not buffering every task. We put in what we think is an estimate for how much time we think it really should take. We focus on those things and we try to get them done as quickly as possible and we uh, get them done as quickly as possible. And we don't leave ourselves any sandbagging time uh, really to just go to waste and so to speak, uh, polish that BB any, long, any longer than we need to. Uh, so when we plan that way, we've got, our, we've got our resources focused on one task at a time, and they're getting it done as quickly as they can. Um, that time absolutely doesn't get wasted. The time we allocate to people just leaves them room to follow up on some new emerging risk, which there's almost always some new emerging risk that needs to be followed up on. Eric, we have uh, two, two more questions. Okay. First one is, uh, do these ideas really apply to people as they do to machines? Absolutely. Um, we're gonna, so, the, so the second one is, is uh, where we get to talking about push versus pull. And, um, so we'll dig into a lot of this more in the next webinar. Um, but in the current one, absolutely. I think uh, there are a number of different uh, other metaphors or examples and analogies that we can think of in everyday life. Um, one is that I like to use quite a bit is uh, Black Friday. And all of the people waiting in line on Black Friday are tasks in our system. And the poor cashier is the resource trying to process those tasks. Um, when we have a big long line of people in our product development systems, very often our cat poor cashier ends up having to work on more than one customer at a time. And so I, yeah, I think absolutely, um, maybe not obviously right off the bat, but absolutely when you get into thinking and looking at it, um, any resource acts like a resource, whether that resource is a machine or a person. And in cases where it's a person, it's even more complex. You've got feelings and uh, opinions, and um, they have lives to lead outside of work that you know have to be accommodated. So, yeah, I think the, 
The answer is absolutely. I don't know, Paul. Do you have anything to add on that one, or? No, I think that that's pretty uh, pretty adequate. Unless anybody has any other comments. Um, there's one more question. Do we have time for it? Uh, I think so. Where okay. are we at? Twelve. Last question is. Yeah, we're doing okay. Okay. If we don't load people to 100 percent, management assumes they aren't busy. Uh, do you have any suggestions on how to make the cultural shift with management? Ah, uh, that's a big one. Uh, well, it has a lot to do with understanding. I mean, we have to build in them this knowledge that we're talking about today, um, and they really need to see it work. Uh, that's really ultimately how we get that. Um, and of course, there's a lot of uh, ways to build knowledge and a lot of ways to show value. Um, and some of them can be in game format, some of them can be in real life format. Um, but ultimately it's all it all comes down to having building an understanding. The good news there as well is it, it doesn't take months and months to to see progress and that things are working. Usually it's it's just a matter of weeks, you know. But, yeah. And um, you know, I'll add to that that you know, all of the techniques we talk about, making the cues visible, reducing the resource, the expected resource loading, um, we don't necessarily have to start out on day one operating everybody at 70%. You know, we can get a little bit of benefit here, a little bit of benefit there, and via those self-reinforcing loops, uh, we can build up to operating at 70% and make gains along the way. So that's that's one of the, you know, good kind of, we're circumventing one of the larger hurdles is not committing to that right away. So having that be a, one of the many tools in the toolbox to help you get the job done better. Um, we'll take a look here at how we do this in Playbook here in a minute. Maybe that'll help. Uh, clarify some things as well. So let's move on. Uh, we'll have another uh, time for more questions here at the end. I just want to make a few more points about you know, making cues visible and having them be manageable when they are visible. Uh, so first question is, what if these tasks weren't very granular? Each one of these is a week, two weeks, three weeks worth of work. And there's a whole mix of subtasks in here, and there's wait time mixed in with work time. So we have to overlap them a bunch. You know, how can we tell what little bits of work we could move to somebody else to remove from the queue to try to clear it if we can't really see much in the way of details inside these tasks? And they're all weeks long. Yeah, it gets a whole lot more difficult. You know, we can't really move work from person to person if we can't really see the little pieces. We can't move it from person to person as well. We can't decide at what to do and what not to do as well if we just simply can't see that work. Secondly, uh, so let's imagine the sustaining engineering project is project Y and the Kappa is project X. Let's put, they aren't even in this system. We're not managing them on the same board or we're just not managing them in this system, how correct would be our assumptions on the completion dates for the you know, A and B tasks that are in the system? You know, how correct and how clear would our queue look if we can't see half of it? Yeah, pretty obvious there. We can't really do much. You know, if, we have, if we don't have most of the work in our system laid out in front of us and able to see it all in one place. Our ability to manage the queues and minimize the queues really is degraded quite a bit. And our expectations about when tasks should be completed aren't met. And what happens when our expectations about the durations of our tasks are not met? What do we do? Now we go ask the resource, hey, what's taking so long? We get in meetings and we talk about what can we do to make things go faster. All because we just don't have visibility to what 
and, and, and add a, accurate expectations based on a real visibility to the queue. Sitting people down to ask them what's taken so long, all that does is add more work to an already overloaded system and make everything worse. Better with nice. easy to make the work visible and have better expectations about when things are going to get done. Eric, there's so, a, a, a quick question was, uh, so how, how do you make the queues visible? Uh, okay, so we're building up to that. Uh, I'm going to table that for one minute while we just talk about the last one. So the last one is clear priorities. So let's imagine here there's no distinction in our queue about what's critical, what's a high priority, and what's a low priority. Let's say everything is yellow or everything is pink. How much uh, does that improve or degrade our ability to move the tasks around to clear the queue quickly? And it doesn't do us any favors, that's for sure. You know, if everything's pink, everything's yellow, we don't know what to do, we can't manage it. You know, we can't we don't know what to do to improve it, we really can't improve it. So um, you know, these are just three of the, the of the other points that come into being um, having cues that are truly manageable. Um, I'll make these points because you know, the traditional visual work management systems that are out there, be they stickies on a board, a whiteboard or something, or one of the digital versions of those tools. Uh, the formats that are typically in use today, uh, either in manual form or digital form, we're all born and raised in software projects for the most part, and we're trying to apply those in hardware projects. And in many cases, because they grew up in software, they don't do these things. They don't necessarily give you the capability to manage a whole mix of different types of projects and many projects like we have in hardware development. You get your CAPAs, your sustaining engineering issues, you got your early risk reduction feasibility studies, you got your get the work done. You've got a huge mix of different types of projects and many projects and uh, most of the systems don't really accommodate those and make them all that visible. They spread them out in all these different places. Um, also, software teams have it pretty easy when it comes to granularizing their tasks. And really, what it comes down to in most software developments is all those tasks are really independent. It's all just a matter of how quickly you can get that feature into that product. And essentially, all of those features, all those tasks are equally critical. Um, sorted in line, and, and there's really no distinction between yellow and pink and critical and not critical in software. So you know, these are all you know, major deficiencies. And before we created Playbook, uh, you know, we worked as consultants, applying stickies and trying some of these software tools uh, to hardware teams. And there were just entirely too many deficiencies. And these are just a few of them. They didn't show overloading. Uh, they didn't help us manage most of the work in the system. They didn't really make priorities all that clear, let alone correct. So we had to go off and build our own tool, which we call Playbook, and which brings me to discuss the Playbook. Um, so we're not going to go into great detail about the functionality in Playbook or how it compares to the other tools. We want to focus more of this webinar series on learning about the system and the aspects of the system to sort of establish how we need to, what we need to do to manage it well. Uh, but we do want to point out a few things because we think really can help you solve the problems in your systems. And, helps make these topics a little bit more clear. So first we're going to talk about the visible cues. Um, you'll note here, here's a view of the cues in Playbook. Uh, you'll see the dot on these tasks. And the dot indicates that that task, all of the predecessors of that task are complete. And really all we need to execute that task is the resource to do it. Uh, you know, recognizing what is in the queue technically from what is not in the queue by saying this shopper is still walking around the grocery store getting stuff. They're not ready. They're not in the queue yet. Those are the tasks that still have predecessors left to be complete. If the shopper's in line at the store right now waiting to get checked out, those are the queue. Those are the tasks where all the predecessors are complete and all we need is the checkout person and they're ready to go. So we make that distinction very clear. Um, 
that queue is visible in both of the primary views where you want to see the queue. One is uh, on the, the queue where we, or the, the view where we put all the projects together into one view, and you can look at any and all of the resources and the items that are in the queue of each of those resources. I have a snapshot of that. Um, the other one is the view where you have your frequent stand-up meetings. It's in those stand-up meetings where you want to look at the queue, you want to see what are the priorities in the queue, and you take, you know, execute the actions to manage that queue and try to keep it from costing you very much. Uh, and you'll see here the, the colors here indicates criticality, the priority level on the task, and the queue is prioritized according to those priority levels. The backlog and the queue are prioritized according to those activity levels. Um, so here's the view that we would use for a daily meeting or a frequent stand-up meeting. Here's the backlog with the queues that are visible in the context of that meeting on that project. Uh, we see here, in addition to visible queues, we see resource loading right here, highly visible across the project. So we call this our capacity dial. Uh, it indicates just how full that resource is for those days. Um, because of the pool system, we haven't pre-scheduled everyone's days out months ahead of time. We have a plan, as we see here. And as those tasks get executed and completed and we pull in the next things, they get laid into the calendar. And in the meantime, the plan updates according to what's happening on the real tasks being executed right now. And for the tasks that are being executed right now, the tasks that are being scheduled in the short term, uh, this utilization dial is instant feedback. It updates as these tasks get added or resized, and each resource updates their day. Uh, we can easily see and try to help people not overload themselves, and we can see the, the multitasking that's created in all of that. Um, does that help, I guess, in terms of the question of how do you make the cues visible? Is this uh, answering that, you think? I think so, but uh, <laughs> what do you guys think who are attending the webinar? Is that, is that helpful? And you see how the uh, queue is made visible? OK. Um, so and, and really kind of um, without, really honestly, without a tool that's going to know what the predecessors are and what the predecessors aren't, the queues get really cloudy. And that's one of the problems with the, the sticky notes and the software tools is they don't necessarily process predecessors and successors very well. Um, certainly the sticky notes, it's really hard to tie this sticky as a successor to that sticky. You end up, you, we end up throwing all, in, you know, using those other tools, you end up throwing all the work, both the stuff that's ready to be executed and the stuff that's not really ready to be executed yet. We throw it in the same stack, and it's really hard to see what the real cues are. So if you're looking for an answer of how do I see these outside of using playbook, honestly, I don't have a great answer for you. The, the best options are put them on stickies, do the best you can to uh, identify what's ready and what's not. You can use cue dots. We used cue dots on our stickies for a long time, and that worked real well. Put a little dot on it as soon as it's ready. Um, but it, it too, is enough manual work that it's... Uh, it eventually degrades and people get lazy and the QDOT doesn't show up and you kind of lose your visibility to those two. Hey, Eric, we're, we're down to uh, one more minute or two left. Okay. Well, no problem. I think uh, we're doing just fine. So um, I just wanted to touch on there's also you know, aspects of playbook which very much reduce bad variability. Certainly we get great historical data about how long stuff really took. Uh, which we can feed into future work estimates. We get measurable and controllable availability. We get better, better uh, control and predictability over durations, and a number of other things that you can see here. Um, we're not going to dig into any of those. Let's we'll keep trucking. Um, just to summarize, uh, queues are costly delays, especially on the critical task, day for day delays, time in the queue to time that we're moving back the end date on our project. Our are also fast feedback about the expected completion dates on our tasks early enough in the process it's, uh, to, to eliminate 
many of those delays, or at least reduce them. And uh, we can minimize the cost of these queues and their presence by um, doing a better job of resource loading, ensuring high availability, reducing bad variability, and bringing visibility and controllability to everything. Uh, so just to touch on real quickly Webinar 2, we're going to do a little bit more on managing demand, both at a system level but primarily at a resource level. How do we do that? How do we ha have resources pull and not multitask when we don't want them to rather than push, you know, rather than us pushing them and causing them to multitask? Uh, we'll talk about really as much as that. We'll talk about clear, correct priorities, how important they are. And um, how you achieve them, and if we have enough time, we'll, and, uh, based on how today went, I think we probably will, but uh, if we have enough time, we'll get in talking about task buffers and project buffers, and if we don't have enough time, we'll cover that in week, webinar three. Okay. Um, since I think we've pretty well covered the questions and we're pretty much out of time, we'll go ahead and move on. Uh, please send us any other questions you have or uh, bring it to the next webinar. In the meantime, we'd like to get some quick feedback for you before you go on with the afternoon. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Um, I'm just going to launch a really quick poll. It's one question. If you have time, just um, please submit an answer. Um, we'd love to hear from you. And this is a series of webinars. So the next webinar is the 21st. Wednesday the 21st at 12 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. We'll have a reminder about that webinar and share. Um, Muted.